Madam Chair, the uh, recording has begun. Okay, thank you, sir. So it's um, 9 1 a.m. And the chair will call the board, the Lone Star College Board of Trustees uh, budget retreat meeting to order. Uh, would like to do a roll call just to make sure that we have quorum. Uh, we'll start with <laughs> Trustee Kane. Present. Trustee Vote. Me too. Trustee Maria. Present. Trustee Pierce. Present. Trustee Sullivan. Here. Okay. Trustee Good. Trustee Wilson. Here. Okay. And Trustee Stoma, I think um, Trustee Stoma and Good will be in later on um, a couple of minutes, correct? Will join us in a couple of minutes. So we do have quorum. Um, next item, Dr. Head, do we have the proper meeting posted? Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. Sorry about that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God and the visible liberty and justice for all. All right, Dr. Head, do we have the proper meeting posted? Yes, it's been posted in accordance with the law. Thank you. Helen, do we have any public comment this morning? No, Madam Chair, nobody has signed up for public comment today. Okay, thank you, ma'am. All right, our next item is the budget updates. Um, uh, I'm going to give the introduction and then turn it over to and, and talk a little bit about the background and then turn it over to Jennifer. Uh, Link, if you're on the if you're on the uh, audio. Uh, Trustee Good is trying to get in, so you might, if you would reach out to her, please. I'll reach out to her, sir. All right. So, board, we have the the meeting is in two parts today, so we'll spend probably up to I'd say an hour, whatever time we need, but just to say from nine to ten. For, and then we, whenever we're finished with this part of it on the budget overview, and uh, then the five year plan, then we'll take. Uh, a, a 10 minute break or so, then we'll go into closed session. So, if you would, um, uh, just we're this is a kind of an unusual situation for us the way we're trying to handle this. So, uh, if you'll bear with us today, we'll, we'll get this figured out. So, a little background here. So, normally we'd be doing this in February, and then we move the meeting back to March and or April, and then we postpone that. And there's a couple of issues that are still out there. We're still, we, we have assessed value. We know what that is. And Jennifer's going to talk about that throughout the, as part of this meeting. We still do not have our final state allocation. We don't have the state allocation, although I think we're, uh, we'll at least be even. And so that that's helpful. The big unknown for us, and keep in mind that on assessed value, that's about 45% of our money right now. So we're good there. The state, we think we're going to be level, at least level, and that's 20%. And then the big unknown we have is uh, tuition and fees, and that's uh, 32, 33% of our money. So it's just too early to tell right now. So some of the things that we're talking about today, uh, we, and keep in mind, this is not a vote today. We're just going over everything with you and tell you where we think we are and get get your thoughts on some issues, but there, there's there's no votes today at all. So, um, again, we're not going to know um, some of these issues until we see what enrollments look like, and that's going to be in the middle of July, maybe later in July, when we normally would be finishing the budget, but we we can work the budget budget out so that we know what our options are. So, with that, we'll get into the program. And Jennifer, are you control you're controlling this? Who's, who's controlling? Yes, I am. Can you see the okay. the slide? It says Board of Trustees budget retreat. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, you can. 
So I'm going to do the first four or five slides, and then I'll turn this over to John. So this is this is the general overview of what we're doing today, and we just want to bring you up to speed on a couple of things and the budget considerations, and then the five-year plan. And I'll hit the first three, four, five slides on construction, and then Jennifer, I'll turn it over to Jennifer for the remainder of her of the budget presentation. So let's go to the first one, Jennifer. Just wanted you to see where we are, and we'll make this available to all of you. We can send this uh, this report to all of you uh, after the meeting, just so you can see it in more detail. But we've uh, keep in mind that the bond passed in 2014, late 2014, and really didn't start building until 16 or so. So you can see kind of where we are, and we've actually. Even though I've been impatient over the pace, keep in mind that we had the hurricane in the middle of all this. We've had COVID. We had some uncertainty about our enrollment. So we've been pacing ourselves on the construction projects. And go to the next one, Jennifer. So we have we have other projects underway. And we're being very careful about what we're doing and just making sure that we got the money. The money is already there, but uh, keep in mind that we need operating money and just making sure that we're in good shape with everything. Next slide. So let's talk just for a second about the Magnolia land. I just want to bring you up to speed over this. So we have finalized the purchase and we're into the planning of the Magnolia Center. It's just taking a long time. If you'll take a look at this chart, the yellow, what's in the yellow box is the original land that we purchased. And again, unbeknownst to us when we purchased it, it was not disclosed to us, was that the bypass, which is in the turquoise kind of color, bluish green there, um, is bisecting the property that we originally purchased. Now, that that may not occur for seven or eight years, but so we, we went ahead, remember what the board gave us approval to buy additional land. So we bought that in the area marked in red, which is adjacent. So we have enough space to, you can see the outline of the proposed building. And I think we're gonna be in really good shape. The, the irony of all this is that we've had the land assessed, the original land, and it's worth now more than when we purchased it. So we're gonna hold on to this for a while and see what's happening and see what the timetable on the bypass is. They have agreed, the TxDOT has agreed that we would have uh, access. They would give us access off the bypass. That's not necessary for us. That would be a backdoor entrance, but we have uh, an entryway. The main entryway, if you're, just, if you're looking at that, is to the left. It's, it's to, the, uh, to the left on the map, yeah, where that uh, Jennifer's moving her arrow. There's an access road there. The main entryway would be right there. So we're doing the planning sometime. Um, It'll be next year before we actually start construction on this. So, next one. Remember that we put up the two buildings for University Park uh, up for sale, and the, we've identified them. If you'll take a look on the kind of the top left up there, those are the two buildings. And I know some of you are more familiar with University Park than others, but that's where our tenants are, and some of that, uh, a lot of that's just vacant. The issue with us over this and the reason that um, we want to sell it is we can't use bond money to for repair and renovation. We can't do that for uh, non-educational use. And so um, if we keep those buildings, and, and again, all these purchases were before most people were on the board, but and before I became the chancellor, but um, what we what we know is if we keep those buildings and we want to maintain them, that we would have to spend up to $15 million or so for upgrades. And that would come out of operating money. So we cannot spend bond money for this. So from a business standpoint, we think that it's in our best interest. And remember, we had this discussion in the, with the board before, but I just want to point this out that those buildings are up for sale right now. Next slide. This is an interesting situation here. Uh, back in 2006, before my time, before I became the chancellor, I didn't become the chancellor in 2014, we purchased uh, this 55 acre plot. This is behind Montgomery, the college. 
And so here's the issue with this. It's not connected to the college property. We can't connect it because we have to go through wetlands to do it. The, the land, uh, we purchased it for uh, $1.6 million and we, we have no practical use for it. I think the original purpose and that um, was maybe for athletic fields, but that doesn't make any sense right now. It has not made any sense for us in, the, in today's world. And we don't have, there's no easy access to it. So we have put this land up for sale uh, some time ago. Now, the, the issue is we paid 1.6 million for it. We have an offer for, um, Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong, 800,000 or so. So that was the initial indications, yeah. yeah. So the, the question for us is, um, you, and you can see where the wetlands is in the middle of it all. So we have an offer on the land of say 800,000, about half the value. The land has decreased in value. We don't think it's going to increase because you can't do a lot with it. And we're probably gonna bring a, a proposal back to the board later the summer in the early in the fall to go ahead and sell the land and just take the loss on it it's not bond money it is operating money and we can take that money that eight hundred thousand that or whatever we can sell it for and just cut our losses over this but we cannot use the land we see we see no use for the land so um we'll we'll come back with you but i and, and talk with you a little bit more about this, but I just wanted to update you over what this is about and why we don't see, I mean, you can see the wetlands right there. So, and I have no other information outside of that. And we've investigated this and reviewed it and talked to people that, and, and some of the people, uh, the people that really knew what the thinking was are no longer with us as on in this earth, on this earth. So, Jim, for the next slide. So I'm going to turn this over to Jennifer right now. This we've been taking a look at what the options are for Kingwood and how to protect Kingwood over the long term. So Jennifer, I'm going to turn this over to you right now. So. Yes, thank you, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I wanted to present here a project that we would like to bring for your consideration to add to our capital project plans. Uh, at right, Kingwood flooded after Harvey. We did the reconstruction. And so now we wanted to look at a mitigation project. So what you see here, this is the 100 year floodplain. In red are the buildings on the Kingwood campus. So you can see that the current 100 year floodplain is very close to the campus. And then this shows the 500 year floodplain. And of course, two thirds of the campus roughly is in the 500 year floodplain. And none of this is official yet, but there have been, um, some news articles and some indications that it's possible that the 500 year floodplain is going to become the new 100 year floodplain when they redraw the map. So if that happens, then now two thirds of the Kingwood campus would be inside of the 100 year floodplain. So the mitigation project is to build flood walls. Uh, this is just a conceptual image of what it could look like. The side here, this right here is a flood wall. This is a flood wall here. And then this, this gray piece here is a flood gate. So it, it, it can be down, of course, when the campus is just open and, and students are walking around the campus. And then this is just an image of the, the flood gate. It would go up, right, if there is some sort of flood event. And so then this shows we would, the proposal is to build this flood wall around that two thirds of the campus that could potentially flood if there were to be another um, Harvey like event or anything uh, of even short of that magnitude, but anything that could flood the campus. So this is the proposal for the project. The estimated cost of the project is 10 and a half million. There is in the bond program there is an oil rig project that has been canceled and those funds have, have not been reallocated. So the proposal is we could reallocate that project funds to this project. 
and, and do it. Now, this project, because it's a mitigation project, is eligible uh, to be covered by FEMA as a reimbursement. Uh, so definitely going to go after that. As we all know, just from working with FEMA to get the reimbursement on the reconstruction, that can take a significant amount of time. So that's why I want to make sure there is the initial funding source uh, with this canceled oil rig project. But then the hope is that at the end of the day, we would be able to replenish those funds from the FEMA reimbursement. And then just wanted to highlight that Harvey cost us $52 million. And with that, right, we, I mean, even though it's slow, we have been receiving the FEMA reimbursement for the reconstruction. We had insurance funds. We also got assistance from the state uh, to cover a lot of this cost of the 52 million from Harvey. But if we don't do a mitigation project at Kingwood and Kingwood were to flood again, we would not be eligible for the FEMA reimbursement on reconstruction if we don't do that. So a, a larger share of that cost would be directly on Lone Star College in the future if that were to flood again. So that is the proposal for the project that we would like to add to our capital project plan. So Jennifer, let's stop there and see if there's any questions or comments from the board, just to make sure they know kind of where we are with everything. I, I, have, I have some questions. Um, that the, 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 the campus site is within a larger drainage area. And some of that area will drain through the campus, typically. I haven't studied the topography on this, but if the if that uh, drainage is not managed, we'll, we'll, we would flood from those waters when we have the gates up, keeping the uh, peak flows from this from the river backing up on us. I, is there a, is there a part in the the program to either divert that around the campus without damaging other property, or how, how is that addressed? Well, per, we own the property around it, but. Um... Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong, but part of this is we've had engineers taking a look at this, and that's all part. That's all part of this project is going to be the flow, and we have had engineers in there. Who are the engineers? I I don't know off the top of my head. Jennifer, we'll Dave, we'll have to get back with you over that. I think unless Jennifer, you know it off the top of your head. I don't know it off the top of my head, um, but I have the uh, engineers report uh, where that the, this project is their recommendation. Okay, I'd like to see that report. Sure. Well, yeah. um, over the long term, uh, any future construction over there, um, I mean, hindsight's great, but it should have been up that hill, up in that higher area up there. You know, the, the topography over there moves. Uh, it, it, if you go from, uh, say, west to east, the elevation up there is probably 10, 12, 15 feet. And hmm. so, uh, some of the newer facilities in the last couple of years and that should have occurred. I mean, that that flood, uh, as you all know, was caused by the letting the water out of the the uh, Lake Conroe, and I know they've addressed some of that, but <laughs> I, I think over the long term, over the long term, we just need to be prepared for other, I mean, I, I, if you think it's not going to rain 40 inches, I thought that but it, it has twice since I've worked here. So we'll, we'll come back with you over. I, I mean, we've got the same issues and the same concerns about spending $12 million over something, but we had almost $52 million in damage. And that's, that's the issue for us is do we spend 12 million in bond funds and hopefully get reimbursed as Jennifer thinks we will. That may take a couple of years, but we'll at least be reimbursed, we think. And um, kind of. I, I have. I have no problem with this, with this project, with this concept. I just want to make sure that we sure. 
cover all of the elements of it. The, it's, yep. It is absolutely necessary. Um, what we'll do is get you the reports and anybody else that wants to see the reports. And I mean, we, we would have to come back, we'll come back into the board for approval of the project after, uh, I'm, Jennifer, that would be in a couple of months. Sometimes at the next couple of board meetings, we'd come back in and make sure that we've got all the information that we need. Mm -hmm. and, um, hey, Steve, let me we don't, jump in if you don't mind. Um, sure. David, you mentioned that water runs through the campus. Do you mean that literally? Or I, I'm really familiar with that campus from living there and attending classes for two years. I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with water running through the campus. Well, we've got we've got property that we're going to develop that's that's higher and right now that runs through the campus and I, I i i'm not familiar with the topography on that campus right now i mean i'm sure the engineers have looked at that but i i'd, I'd just like to review it sure and, and we all want to be we all want to be as informed as possible i was just I didn't want the other trustees to hear you say that water runs through the campus when we, first of all, water doesn't run through the campus, and two, uh, you're not now you're not sure. So I just want to just want to highlight that. The, as Steve said, the flood when the when we flooded last time, it was from the San Jacinto River backing up and Lake Houston backing up in the San Jacinto River. Um, it was it was not from water coming through the campus. I, I understand. Okay. All right, a, thank you. Uh, Jennifer, copy me on that engineer report, please. Yeah. Sure. And, and just to orient everyone right here, if you can see my cursor where it says HPC, that is where the new um, health professions building is getting built. And it, like Dr. Head said, on this side of campus, it is sort of up a hill. So this is on higher ground where this new building is going up currently. Jennifer, show them the next slide. and. Uh... So the, the, where, where the water, well, go ahead and then we'll get to the end. The next, go, yes, go ahead. Just want to show them what that, this is what the, uh, sorry, Jennifer, keep, you keep on your schedule. Just show them what it actually looks like. Yeah. This one, is this the one you wanted to go to? Yeah, just so you know what it looks like on campus. I mean, that that's a visual of what it would look like, right? And so um, then the next slide, Jennifer. I mean, I don't know if you've all seen these things. I know they have them around, but uh, these hydraulic, uh, basically gate. But there's a there's a wall that extends yes. from the gates. That's just to let right. Right. water and access. Right here. It's the yes. next slide. There Here's the side walls right here. And then this is the gate down. Show them the next uh, slide, Jennifer. The one that uh, kind of outlines where everything is or would be. This one. Yeah. So, Dave and Mike, the the water flow, the, the way it is right now, there's a creek. If you take a look at that map, it's at the top up there. That there's a drainage ditch that comes in there, uh, and that does flow through a part of the campus that we don't use very much. And we own the property right on the other side of that, but uh, that's, uh, Dave, you're right in terms of the, that, that is a flow that all drains down in that direction. It then goes on to, uh, there's a swamp over there and then it goes down to the river. It just, yeah. it's just not a natural flow the way, because of all the construction, I think over there and just the natural topography it kind of goes down and filters down to the left into athletic fields and, you know, we've got the tennis course, the athletic fields, and then the river down there. But it backs up in that stream up there right to the top of it's top the street from where that wall is. So you're right about the, the flow coming through the campus, but it's on that side of the campus. It's not down through the main part of the campus, but it does leak into the campus over there. So that makes it it's almost like a... We're, we're talking about building levees, basically, something like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and so these two buildings right here, the music building and the SCC, did not flood in Harvey 
and then up here is where the new building is get going up. So it does go up to higher ground in this direction here. What what is what? Well, you can't see that the. Uh, is that a, is that a parking lot over? To the right and up and up along the blue. Yes. Here? Yes, it is. Yes, that's a parking oh, lot, parking. and this is a parking lot. Uh, this right here is a uh, detention pond. Uh huh. There's another uh -huh. picture of that one. See is, here, is that... you can see the detention pond, and here's the parking lot, and another parking lot right here. Is that detention pond? Designed for the development of the rest of the campus. Where is the detention pond, Jennifer? Right here. I don't think so. I don't know. We'll have to get back with you over that. But we've had some issues um, on a couple of the heavy rains when we, when the last building was constructed. It uh, ended up flooding right there in the middle of the campus. Because of the way the drainage was, and this was, I think, completed maybe before I became the chancellor. I, I know it was. They, it's that health building down there, so they they put that building in there to, uh, or put that drainage in there to help mitigate. And I say flooding; uh, it would the water would pool in front of the buildings down there and around the buildings because of the oh, lack of drainage. Yeah. It, it all, you can't really tell it. And if we sometime, if you all want to go, whoever wants to take the, the campus, if you're looking at the topography, it, if you take, if you go from the bottom to the top, it goes downhill about, I don't know, six or eight feet, probably something like that. And then it drains into that ditch down there. So from the bottom of this to the top, which is south to north, it, it drains, everything drains t toward the creek down there. And then if you go to the right, it goes uphill. Uh, again, from the from the far left to the right is probably 10 or 12 feet, something like that. So Jennifer, the, the parking lot to your to the right and where the new building is going to be constructed, that's higher ground, correct? Yeah. Yes, everything yes. Okay. this is higher ground and along with the building. There is, we are also building additional detention capacity and, and I mean, that's part of the requirements in putting in the new building. So there will be additional detention capacity with this. Um, mm -hmm. But that that does not address sort of that. This 500 year, possibly 100 year flood event. Okay, yeah, uh, Jennifer, I, I, I just want to make a comment as uh, you know, not an engineer. Not as anything, we just as a plain taxpayer. Now, we are talking to our constituents of taxpayers. And the way this is coming across is like we keep building on the sites that have flooded. Why do we keep building and reconstruction on the same sites that we know are prone to flood? I mean, as a taxpayer, that's what I want to know. But let, let's get away from all the other gibberish that we're talking about. But how are you going to convince me in an area? that has flooded, that has done all of this, cost us all this money. How do we keep uh, going? You know, it's like my house, if it totally flooded out, how many times am I gonna keep going back to my insurance company and asking them to rebuild? I, I don't, I mean, I'm all for growth and expansion, but I wanna make sure that we're sure. not, you know, sure. you understand where I'm sure. going with this, that we don't yeah, keep rebuilding on the same sites that we know it's in the 100 year plan or the flood plane, 500 year, because it, it's just a waste of money. I mean, we have to, that, that's what I'm saying. How do you convince your taxpayers that, hey, we're not just uh, uh, rebuilding you know, uh, over the same flood plane over and over again, and we keep, it's insanity and keep getting the same results. Sure. We, we are not building anything additional in this area. That's why this building, we specifically chose to put it on higher ground outside of that flood area. Uh, moving the buildings themselves, that would be cost the existing buildings that are in that plane, that would be cost prohibitive uh, at, as an alternative to doing this flood wall. So the flood wall is really just to protect what's existing. 
uh, that would be cost prohibitive to move all of these buildings. But any new construction, like I said, this building here, we are building outside of yeah. what has flooded previously. Trustee Pierce, I, I, I agree. I totally agree with you. So since I've been the chancellor, the, the only construction we're going to have is out of that floodplain. Okay. And, and we know that we have an issue with already existed. Now, having said that, we've actually had one flood and since the college opened, one cut one major flood due to the storm we had with Harvey. I I, I agree with you in terms of uh, we need to be really, really careful with all of our sites and we are elevating across the system. Whatever they said the floor plan is, if it's 122 feet, then we're moving it up even higher to 126 or 127, something like that. We're adding additional space or uh, height based on what the engineers are telling. I, I'm I'm in agreement with you. I, I, uh, I think that these buildings over the years, and I'm talking about over an extended period of time, we, we don't want to keep adding money back into buildings that we think might flood. Now, having said that, they've changed the flood plan a couple of times. But I, Steve, can, Steve, this is uh, Linda Good. Can I make yeah. a comment about uh, that? Uh -huh. um, most people don't realize that the flood plains are not retrospective. I mean, they're, they're not prospective, they are retrospective. Right. So it's based on what has happened in the past. It's not predicting what may happen in the future based on changing weather patterns, new construction, all of those kinds of things. So we have to assume, I think, uh, experience teaches to be very conservative about floodplains. And that's why what currently is showing as a 500 year floodplain is probably going to be changed to a 100 year floodplain. And as we've seen over the last five years, we've had a number of 100 year floods just in the last five years. So that's why it's really important to not assume that if you're in the 500 year floodplain, you're okay. Cause that's why we're getting these changing maps. That's all I want to say. Well, we'll have the engineers report and come back to you. But I, I mean, I, this is not only true for Kingwood, but um, every building since Harvey, <laughs> we have been really, really careful over making sure that everything is, um, uh, take into consideration where the floodplains are, where they could be. I mean, every piece of land that we've looked at, we've had the same same discussion about. So we'll put everything together and then come back to you. And then ultimately the board can make a decision about uh, the direction that we want to move here. So. Andy, if I may, the only comment I want to make, if I may, um, the, um, uh, there are a lot of engineers, uh, the people who of course know a lot more than I do about <coughs> the floods and, uh -huh. and, uh, and the history and all that. Uh, uh, the only thing I would want to make sure we 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 continue to to work is with with the different ent entities because from my um, uh, my uh, you know where I go to meetings and when uh, when I hear what's going on up in in that area, you get a different ent uh, political entities or, or regional groups talking about you know the levies and about the proposals and all that and you know and and all I want to make sure is that we, that it, whatever we do is in line with whatever else is happening. I know you mentioned letters sure. earlier. How is that going to affect us? How, how should we? Is there something else we need to do in, in light of that? So, and I'm sure our engineers are doing that. I just want to emphasize that so that we don't like find out something later that that we didn't know. That's all. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure everybody knows we we I, I've I've got it. I mean I do. I, I don't. I was a president over there and lived in Kingwood, and just um, that that. Financially, between the fifty million dollars that, and we almost recovered what eighty percent of that from FEMA and insurance in the state, but um, <coughs> toll on us uh, financially and just the health and welfare of everybody. I mean, I think these are critical decisions that we're we're talking about here. So, uh, but we've had one flood like this. Um, in the 50 years of our existence. And so I, I don't, you know, we need to be prepared. We've learned a lot of lessons, let me put it that way, about construction and where to put uh, servers and generators and everything else out of all this. 
So, but I trust you, Pierce. I hear exactly what you're saying. As a taxpayer, I have the same interest <laughs> and the chancellor. So, okay. So, you're going to move on here. Then we'll we'll come back with you with more information about this. So. So this is uh, briefly what we're going to talk about next is um, our proposals. But these are the issues that we have. So Jennifer, I'm going to let you talk about the first couple of them. Yeah. So for budget considerations, as, as Dr. had mentioned, typically this retreat meeting happens in February, and then we come again to the board at the beginning of June with a workshop <clears throat> presentation, and then the final budget actually gets voted uh, on by the board to be approved at the August board meeting. Uh, we are still trying to roughly follow that timeline. Clearly this meeting is happening later and, and we uh, will subsequently have to decide when we want to do a workshop meeting. And then again, uh, still hitting that deadline of the board considering the a full budget here in August. So wanted to walk through some of what we are looking at as we're building this budget. So first on tuition and fees. The, the recommendation is no tuition increase for fall of 2021 or all, any of next year, including spring, no tuition increases. The student activity fee for the summer and fall, the board has already approved to waive that fee for the summer coming summer term and then the fall. Uh, the thought is if hopefully students are back by the spring 2022 term that that might be the appropriate time to allow that fee to be reinstituted, uh, re which really means no action from the board for that to happen because the board has to take action to waive it. So uh, with no action, what would just automatically happen is that fee would become reinstituted in the spring of 2022. Uh, so, and that is the thought of what we will assume in the budget. I just want to pause any thoughts or questions on tuition and fees before I move on. Next is the separation incentive plan. Uh, this program has already been in front of the board twice. First, the board had to approve us contracting with an outside firm PARS to, to explore this possibility for us. And then this past uh, February, it was either February, March, uh, the board did also approve for us to open up an enrollment period for employees to en enroll. Still with having to come to the board a third time, once we had actual enrollees for the board to consider whether or not we actually go implement this. So now it is time for the board to take this final consideration. There will be an agenda item at the June board meeting with this. So when we were working up to this, when PARS ran their analyses, they had assumed a 9.8% participation rate. And that was actually based on prior experience specifically with Lone Star College uh, when this was done a few years ago. After the enrollment period closed, we saw an actual participation rate of 14.36%. So we did get significantly more participation than, uh, than the last time Lone Star College. Uh, did a program like this. So this table shows you what the projected savings would be over five years is $5 million. You can see the majority of that is in year one. And then over the five year period, we have payments that go to PARS to cover the, the annuities that employees receive through the separation incentive plan. Uh, but it's still a positive 5 million projected savings over that five year period. Dr. Head, was there anything you wanted to add to this consideration? So we have a, uh, the replacement is staggered. So again, we need to pay the annuity. And we've already been talking to the presidents and the vice chancellors about what their replacement schedule looks like. We will, um, the savings that we have, which would average about a million dollars a year for the next five years, will, um, We'll develop a, uh, a hiring plan for everybody. In other words, you, we have some critical positions we think that need to be replaced, like a police officer, for example. But um, 
this is all dependent upon which we've done this before. This will be the third time that we've done this. So we'll stagger those hires and make sure that we have the savings that we said we were going to have here. So, so we've got about 140 people or so that um, that have taken advantage of this or will take advantage of it if the board approves it. And I, I think it puts us in a good, it really does put us in a good position, I think, going forward as we come out of COVID. And this is an addition to we reduced our the number of employees, uh, no furloughs, no layoffs, just uh, when we had openings. And keep in mind that we have 2,800 full-time employees. So we've already reduced, um, I think we're going to be at about 5 or 6% or so of a, a reduction with our employees that we found out during COVID. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit more about this in closed session, but I think that uh, we're going to be in pretty good shape coming out of COVID. So that's all, Jennifer. Okay. So the next significant item that needs to be considered for building next year's budget is a cost of living adjustment. This table shows the history of what we have. Uh, what Lone Star College has done for cost of living adjustments, typically for several years now, we have done either a two or 3%. This current budget year, last September, especially with COVID, we did do zero. So that's the history of what we've done. Uh, and I mean, some of that is 10, 15 million over the years that has been do done in cost of living increases. And then in addition to that, we have had major compensation initiatives as well. Uh, that came after some market studies that was done to ensure that all of our employees were you know, at, a, at a good place. So now for this coming year, all right, you can see the Houston Consumer Price Index from February 20 to February 21. Uh, so this is still a preliminary. We don't have the full year number yet, but it's at 4.5%. So inflation is looking to start running higher than it has in prior years. So that's where we wanted to consider perhaps a 2% increase for that cost of living adjustment. The thing to be cautious about is a cost of living adjustment, any pay increases on our budget has a very significant impact, uh, especially a compounding recurring impact, right? Even when you look three, four, five years out, um, just because obviously that recurs each year. And then if the following year, if there's another 2%, it's on that higher number. So really wanted to present this for everyone's thoughts because the feeling is it, it's very, it's important for employees, but at the same time, we need to make sure our overall finances stay strong um, as they currently are strong. So just a, a idea we are looking at is building that 2% into the budget but keeping it contingent, maybe delaying when we actually implement it so that it could be contingent on having an actual positive credit hour growth. And then maybe having a plan for if we don't have a positive credit hour growth, if it's negative, then perhaps we could do one time stipends for employees. That way there is still something for employees, but not something that has as significant as a compounding effect over the years. So. We're gonna, we're gonna yeah, we'll show you what this looks like in the 5 year plan in just a minute. But I, I just want to point out that. We, until we can see what this enrollment growth looks like, it kind of has us pinned down. And so normally. We would have a firmer recommendation over this, but because of COVID, we just can't quite tell about the enrollment pattern. And so. The campus presidents are predicting pretty flat growth and. Uh, we factor that into our budget proposals, but if we're down again, keep in mind every percentage point is $1.2 million, $1.2 million. So if, if we had a reduction of three or 4%, which I, I don't think is going to happen, but um, that, that means that we're going to be down three or $4 million again and projected revenue. So what we're going to do is uh, what we thought we want to do is come back in. We'll know in July when we uh, finalize what we think 
would be pretty close to finalizing the budget what this actually looks like and what our firmer recommendation would be. We'll be able to tell the trends though, I think in July of the enrollments. If the enrollments are healthy, then we would be recommending the 2%. And if not, we can talk about the one-time option. But again, we're gonna talk about this in the five-year plan. And so you can just see what it looks like. Keep in mind that if we do a 2% across the raise and a $2 adjunct, which I'm in, I'd like to do, but um, that's a $6 million, $6.2 million that we're, we, we have to add to the budget going forward. So I'm optimistic about our, our future. I am. It's just the immediate issues that we have right now, uh, making sure that we don't make a commitment that we're going to have trouble meeting in the next year or two. So. So we're not asking for a vote today. We're just laying out kind of what the, I mean, this is not a voting session. This is just a, uh, for information that we'll come back with to you with more, more specifics as we know, as we have more information. Thank you. So then the next item is campus budget adjustments. So the way our budget allocation model works is pre-COVID, right, typically in uh, strong growth years, we will allocate additional funds to the campuses for growth, to cover growth. What we don't do is if any particular campus is not growing, we don't go in and reduce their allocation. Um, and I mean, that is part of how we want it to be. Uh, but over time, we do still need to just be aware of where all the campuses are at. Now campuses, right, they do have different programs. They do have different operations. So we don't expect campus budgets on a per student basis to ever be identical, but we do wanna make sure everyone's within some reasonable range of each other. That way we don't get too much say inequities within the budget that any particular campus has. So the table that you see is showing for each campus, the budget by year per full-time student equivalent. And then what uh, you see here, this line system-wide, this is the system-wide average. And then below that, this is standard deviation. So just to have some rule of thumb of what is a reasonable range around that average is I've used the standard deviation. So campuses that are within one standard deviation of the system average, those are shown in green. If a campus is more than one standard deviation above that average, that's what's in red. And then campuses that are less, that are more than one standard deviation below that average is in yellow. So you can see that we have uh, the North Harris campus and Tomball campuses are are relatively high across the system where a sci fair is relatively low so what you'll see when i go to the five-year plan is over a three-year period we want to give everyone time to make appropriate operational adjustments but there is in the in the five-year plan and in the fy22 draft budget that we're building adjustments to those three campuses that have gotten sort of outside of a of this one standard deviation range of the system average, just so we can help make sure that all campuses are treated, you know, fairly within the budget allocation. So just so we're clear about this, we we took out Houston North just because it's an anomaly and we we basically front loaded Houston North to make sure they had enough budget to do what they need to do to grow. And of the colleges right now, Houston North is has the highest percentage of growth. And, and as we look to the fall and summer right now, it does. But let's just put that in a proper perspective. It's uh, they don't have that many students. So when they're. We think, though, and I thought this from the beginning, it just it take a while and it has with every other uh, campus that we've opened like this. It just takes a while to get the word out and the growth. So. They're in good shape budget wise. You can, I mean, just, you can see. Proportionally that they have almost twice as much money per capita than anybody else. So the, 
the anomalies here are uh, North Harris, which, and we're reducing that budget, and Tombaugh, we're reducing that budget. And Jennifer's working with the president to uh, kind of phase this in. And Cy Fair is the one that's under budgeted. And of course, they're the largest and they've had the sustained growth. We're trying to get within these ranges, though, to be fair to everyone. And we've made uh, adjustments. I just want you to know that we, we've made adjustments in terms of uh, if they have workforce programs, there's a different formula for workforce as opposed to academic uh, transfer. And, and the reason I'm saying that is because it costs a lot more money to operate the workforce program. So we're making those adjustments in the budget. Uh, overall, what we're trying to do is set up these uh, campuses and anybody else on performance metrics so that we can be fair and consistent and equitable to everyone. I mean, we're, we're doing this all across the board, not only from the business standpoint, but from student success to make sure that um, we know exactly what the campuses are doing and what the goals are. And if somebody is out of range, then we need to make that adjustment. So. Okay, Jennifer. So last slide here before I switch uh, which screen I'm sharing so I can switch to the five year plan. But then just some other budget priorities that you'll also see is restoring our repair and placement budget, uh, some uh, additional facilities, maintenance items. And then uh, Dr. Head also has uh, budget priorities here that he just sort of alluded to a little bit of diversity, veterans and disabilities. Yeah, just very quickly, and again, we'll talk about this a little more um, in the next part of the presentation, but uh, we do want to restore the repair and renovation budget, replacement budget. I, I Every time I talk about this to different groups internally and externally, this is kind of like your house or your car or anything else. We delayed improvements last year because of COVID, and we don't want to get behind schedule. Some of these issues, whether they be roofs or plumbing repair or any kind of renovation, it's like your house. They're not going away. They're just not going away. So every year we wait on this, we're just accumulating more. If we needed 4 million last year, then we need 4 million plus some this year. And so that same thing on uh, this facilities maintenance. So I think we've got 1.6 or uh, uh, Six million, Jennifer, in the budget. Uh, between both repair and replacement and facilities maintenance, yes. Yeah. About six million. So you'll see that in the five-year plan. But I just want to make sure you were aware that we're um, we don't want to keep falling behind in this because um, all we're doing is uh, kicking the can down the road when we do this. Same thing on diversity, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in in the next part, but. Uh, what we want is consistency across the system. We, and this is true for veterans and disabilities. What we see right now is um, if, if we don't take some adjustments over this and, and overall what we're seeing is much more of a system wide approach. It, it doesn't help us if we have 4 colleges uh, really moving ahead and issues like diversity or veterans and disabilities. Then we have 3 that are have other, they think they have other priorities. To me, these are system wide priorities and uh, it, it, to me, it doesn't make any difference where you are. You should have the same level of service across the system. And so we, um, we have budget items that we want to be consistent and have much more system oversight what we're doing here. So, Jennifer. Dr. Head, before we, I do yep. have a, a question on the slide. Um, yeah, if we could stay there. When you talk about budget priorities and disabilities, can you give me an example or give us an example of what that is? Yeah, well, every, yes. So we have all kinds of disabilities. And I think right now we've got about 3,000 students or so that have been identified with disabilities. It could be, um, some of them are learning disabilities. Some of them are physical disabilities. Some were born with it. Some have had issues in their lives that created this. So, um, um, some students need more assistance than others. And uh, uh, I mean, it could be somebody with, say, MS or cerebral palsy, for example. Um, so, what happens is, you can go to one campus and get one level of service. 
you can go to another campus and get a different level of service. And I just don't think that's right for students. I just don't think that's right for students or parents. And so mm -hmm. we, we want to make sure that, that that's, um, well, first of all, we want more system oversight of that. And we want to make sure that the resources are proportionally to some extent, but sometimes I'll just say if uh, Houston North may not have the funds to do that, then that's where the system office steps in and make sure that that happens. So same thing with veterans. We veterans should not be fishing around for the best level of service. That shouldn't that should not be occurring to me. It doesn't happen very often, but the more we grow and the more we add another college and then we see. Um, and, and to be fair about it, of having and having been a college president. So what happens is uh, you have you assign somebody else to disabilities, and then or assign a person to disabilities. I know when I was at North Harris, we had disabilities people only. Some of the colleges that don't have as much money might say, "Well, you're going to do disabilities, and I want you to be the admissions clerk, and I want you to do this to be an advisor when you're not doing anything." And when these students show up, I don't want to tell them that, "Hey, you've got to come back on." If they show up on Tuesday and go, we well, need to make an appointment and come back. I I want them to deal with these students like now. I mean that that's. Yeah. I think you all know this. For a lot of our students, it takes a lot of courage for them to just show up. Period and ask for help. That's not we we. Um, I am just determined, and I think what we've seen with COVID is uh, we need to help these students every way we can, uh, whether it be with wraparound services with the counseling piece of it and the mental health piece and disabilities and veterans, they're they're counting on us for assistance. And so I I, I just want the resources distributed and I want the system office to make sure that everybody's got what they what they need. Does that does that help? Yes, yes it does. I mean we just want to make sure I mean I'm for yeah for this type of thing. I mean we want to make sure that our student that goes to North Harris receive the same services as the one that goes to Tomball. So, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, yes, I'm, I'm that's that's what we're striving. I have a question, uh, sure. Dr. Head sure. Jennifer Weber. OK, diversity. Explain to me. What that really means and what is the budget about? And I hope it's not about some more. I uh, would have called professional developments. See, I've been diversity professional developed to death and I'm sure a lot of other people have too. What do you mean by budget when it comes down to diversity? Well, what what are you putting about? the money in? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so what we want to do is, it's again, it's, uh, and I, I don't mind talking to you more off uh, away from there. But so, uh, uh, Carly, your right has come in, and what what we know is that we've got a couple of colleges that have assigned people to be their internal directors of, and I'm, that's a small D, They're, they are responsible for diversity activities. And I'm talking about everything from training to awareness to helping with recruiting and advising and monitoring how committees are put together and just what we're doing in general. We have issues such as um, uneven student success rates that some colleges are paying more attention to that than, they, than others. So what we were talking about is um, having diversity naming uh, managers or program managers or coordinators or something like that. We haven't decided on the title, but uh, they would be reporting directly into Carly Shear Wright, who is our chief diversity officer, who reports to me, making sure that we're talking as a system together so that we're all doing basically the same. Now, each college or each campus has some, if they want to add something, that's fine. But uh, again, we have some colleges that are talking about it and engaging and others that are not. Part, part of this, uh, Trustee Pierce, is um, also we want every campus to have a diversity committee so that they can talk. Um, what are there's perceptions and there are perceptions that people aren't being treated fairly. We need to know what that's about and what, how we can, if, if there's a perception that's happening, then we need to deal with that. So. I guess all I'm saying is being a woman and an African American woman, I I don't see, you know, training, 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 like staff, but you know, that's, that's not changing anybody's minds. Okay, like, let, let's just put it on the table. And I personally have had, I don't know why I've had 
I've had diversity training up to the kazoo. And I go to the same old training. That is not what's going to bring about diversity. I'll say Good. it again. It begins with leadership. It begins with the board, begins with you. If we are not putting diverse faces on these colleges and have people, that is their job, part of it, to be diverse, you can do all the training in the world. I can tell you what happens in trainings. As an educator, I've been to, I mean, listen, a lot of the board members are not educators. I am a former educator. And I know we've been, I've been trained to death. And it's the same old soup warmed over the next day. So what I'm saying is we have to, training is not key here. That is not the key to diversity. The key to diversity has to be placed on the foot and steps of leadership. If we don't, if you can look at your colleges. Now, I'm just gonna be honest. I don't see a woman that looks like me uh, over any of these college campuses. Now, I have, uh, even with, uh, you know, and I, I told you about that, what I thought about the last, I mean, you know, I'm glad to see, uh, what's her name, uh, Dr. Gonzalez. I really am, to be over at Kingwood, made me feel better. Now, but I don't see anybody looks like me anywhere. And, uh, you know, black women are the most educated group in the nation right now when it comes out to education. So all I'm saying to you is, let's not get into all this training again. That is not going to, I mean, I know you think it will, but it will not. It will start with you and will end with the board because we have to approve. That's just, uh, I'm just tired of seeing money just, uh, you know, okay, you hired a diversity person, you know, uh, woohoo. That doesn't mean anything to Trustee Pierce, you know, who's been out in this world. We have to be the ones to promote diversity. And if we are not going to take that leadership role, we don't even need to be on this board. That's one of the reasons you have single member districts is because of diversity, because of the lack of diversity. Now, those of you sitting on the boards and because you are, you are diverse, because you're there, we need to be steadfast in making sure that we promote diversity. Just like our student body, you know, even with, with our disadvantaged youth, we're becoming more and more at risk at LSC than anybody. Our student population, that is, if you're really looking at them and it cuts across. So that's my thing with diversity. I, I don't think personally, uh, as a trustee, that any more taxpayers' money should be placed on training diversity we need we, we need we need to put uh, put it down and we need to make sure that you know our the staffing and whatever else we have reflects diversity that that's the only way you're going to do it if, if the training i hate to tell you dr head tell you like my husband the judge tells me he can't legislate feelings i don't care how much training and policy you do you can't legislate feelings you can't make people change their minds on, on what they feel i'm just saying that uh, it should be, I, I know by training, and I know, and, I, and believe me, Dr. Ed, I know you mean well. I'm just telling you from somebody who sure. is a minority, who is a woman, who has been through more training than I would care to even go into. And, and being in these trainings, people are asleep, <laughs> they're bored, they don't want to be there. It's the same old thing over and over again. And, and like I said, and how many times, uh, you know, people are not going to really tell you what they feel. If you do, if, if you do an anonymous survey, I mean anonymous, where it can't be traced, you get a good idea of what your employees think about diversity at Lone Star. Now they're not going to say anything as long as you can tag them. I wouldn't either. You know what I mean? Because I, I I don't want any retribution coming back to me. But that is just my view on diversity. I, I think that. Uh, 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 throwing money at it is not the is not the key. Okay, that that's my, that's my thoughts, and uh, sure. I just wanted to get that out. Just, just so we're clear though about this though, these we don't we don't view these uh, representatives as doing the training on the campuses. That that's a system wide thing that comes through another office that we have. But I I hear what you're saying. I'm, I'm we. What I do think though is, um, uh, or at least you're right. I think she's been spending a, time, a lot of time talking with people and people I think will talk to her where they might not be talking to us or some of the other leadership. Um, we are also going to be setting up, uh, again, metrics. Um, uh, uh, yes, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying is that uh, people might not tell us and these perceptions or what I think is important, but I do think that 
being consistent across the campuses and having somebody on that campus that reports into somebody at the system office is going to be really, really important. They're not the trainers, by the way. They were not responsible for the training. We didn't want to do that. I just want to clarify that piece of it. I don't mind talking to you about this uh, again over. I mean, if you have ideas about what we ought to be doing, I'm, I'm really open to that. Or at least you're right, though, done a really good job of reaching out to. I, I can't tell you how many people she's talked with a lot, a lot. And we've got. Uh, Chair Saldivar, could I um, jump in when Steve's finished? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Dr. Head, holler when you're done. I'm done. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a budget consideration, it's a priority. And it's a list of five items that the system wants to focus on. I'd, I'd like to tell you from my perspective, I applaud the effort uh, on each of these from repair and replacement to maintenance of diversity, veterans and disability. Uh, and I'd also like to say this, Carlisi Wright is an absolute rock star, uh, proven record, uh, well-respected in her field. And I think probably one of the best hires the university's made in a long time. And I'm not friends with her. I don't mean that in a bad way. So my comments are genuine. They're not biased at all, but I watched her work at the city and she did a remarkable job and was recognized for her work. So one thumbs up for that. Two, diversity, uh, this diversity training is for our faculty and for our staff, but it's gonna help our students. And we have a rotation of students every year, every semester that come in to the system. And we probably should not assume that they are exposed to diversity training or diversity points of view, bias, uh, and the other factors that play into it. <clears throat> so we do need our teachers, our faculty, and our staff to be trained to work with these students so that they can tamp down the bias uh, in, in the racism and uh, whatever else you want to call it. And, and I applaud the effort and, and I, I'm i happy to be a part of it. And I just want to give you a, a thumbs up on it from my perspective, certainly not to argue with any other trustee about it. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair, can I speak to? Uh, thank you, Trustee Hellman. Uh, who would, Mark? Trustee Maroon, yes, sir. Hi, okay, um, yes. Um, I'm, I'm going to make a plug for another budget consideration on, on the list, which is disabilities and and um, appreciate the efforts. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say about that is, is that uh, there is a, you know, a nationwide uh, or a broader movement, I guess, uh, universal design, universal accessibility. And, and what that's about is coming up with, with standards that uh, entities all over, whether, whether it's transit, universities, can adopt to, to facilitate uh, better performance or better education, better transit service, you know, all around. I, re I mentioned that just to say that, uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to take a positive outlook, right? That there, there, there's plenty of potential, but, but we, need to, we need to observe and we need to carry out those, those recommendations that exist uh, uh, at a broader level. I mean, there is a lot, I mean, out there. So as, as trustees, I, I'd like, you know, as we move forward, Kind of like uh, be informed and, and, and encourage the, the, the university, the, the college system, and the chancellor to, to continue promoting those. And and also wanted to mention that because it also, of course, applies to issues with diversity and veterans. Uh, that I mean, I like to think that uh, we're we're moving forward in many many ways. I mean, I, I'm a, um, um, in many ways I'm, I'm I am like uh, like Trustee Pierce about how. You know, we've been plenty of training. We've been to plenty, plenty of. Uh, we know what needs to be done. All that so stuff, and sometimes we get discouraged. But, 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 let, but, uh, but we, this is not 20 years ago. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, Trustee Sullivan, he made very, very, very good points, and it's a lot that uh, about the the fact that uh, uh, we have excellent uh, people and 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 our staff do and working on this. So I, I, I just wanted to do make sure encourage staff and everyone to to and, and remind to inform us as trustees, what are those movements, what are those things that are working? What are the metrics? Uh, we can't simply talk about it once a year at some training or anything. And this has to be something that happens at every meeting, at every it's you know, everything that you know, we do need to address the fact that it, it is sometimes it gets complicated, you know, we're 
and during rough times, politically difficult periods of, you know, we are in one of those right now. So we need to, to go through those, and sometimes it's, it's not easy, and we need to understand that. In other words, you, you can legislate morality or, or, or what people should do and all that. Ultimately, we, we hopefully people understand that in the end, we all benefit from it, the institution, uh, the board, the community, and I think we're in the right track, but, but we do need to see action and results. Thank you. We'll come back in and give regular updates. Uh, I, I, wanna, I do wanna state that um, in our discussions, and I'm meeting with Carlicia every week, by the way. Um, this isn't, this is beyond racial diversity, right? It's uh, lifestyle, it's you name it. And we're very diverse in our system, very diverse with students and our and our employees. So we'll come back in and give reports to the board. And then um, I, I am very open to suggestions and comments you might wanna have. If, if there's something specifically you think we need to be focused on, then I'm, I'm more than happy to sit down and talk about what that looks like. Right. Madam Chair, this is um, Air, Aisha Aaron Wilson. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Yes, Trustee Wilson. Um, I just have a quick question um, because I'm just listening to all the viewpoints and I just want to know, like, um, you're saying we need this training, but let me ask, when these professors and administrators and people are hired at our colleges, are they not already getting training on diversity and and yeah. and things of that nature? You, you understand yes, what I'm are. saying? It's so mandatory if they, training. Yeah. Okay, so if yeah, they this, are, then why is this additional training needed? Um, not, I'm not, I this, guess I'm not understanding. You know what this, isn't, this isn't a training position. This is somebody on campus. I, I wanna clarify that this is not a training position. The purpose of these these individuals that we would have is not training. It is a, it's an awareness. Um, we we wanna make sure that student, this is about the message that students are getting, making sure that we recognize everything from, I'll just say Juneteenth to Black History Week to um, his, the, we have the month for Hispanics. It's about making students aware and having presentations and programs. It, it's also about employees. I, I continue to be amazed that some, as Trustee Sullivan pointed out, there are a lot of employees that we have that just are not even thinking about what they're thinking about sometimes over these particular issues. This isn't a training position at all. It's not. We do have mandatory training for everybody that's hired when they come in. It is mandatory. Every year it's mandatory. And we talk about everything from uh, IT security to diversity issues to all the legal issues that we have. So we have a three, four hour training program for every single employee every year. And that's where this is, um, the diversity training that you're talking about is embedded in that. This is not that kind of a position. That, that's not what they're doing. So, okay, I guess I'm just trying to understand. Um, with each person, like you having a dive, let's say, let's call them a diversity coach or whatever on each campus, uh -huh. and they yeah. report back to um, her, uh, Ms. Carisha Wright. Right. So, what is, I guess, I'm trying to figure out what is the goal in doing that? You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what are, what is the outcome Lone Star is looking for for doing that? You know, like. Sure. Well, I, I think that, um, well, a couple of things. One, I want to make sure that we're consistent across the campus. I'd like to know what the issues are. If our employees, whatever, whether they're Hispanic, Black, Asian, mm -hmm. uh, they have an alternative lifestyle. If they feel like there's some kind of bias or there's some kind of issues there. We need to know about it, and the campus president needs to know about it. And that's the reason that we want these. Um, I'd like to know if there's an issue at a particular campus. Do I think there's one now? Not directly like that. But if people think that uh, they're not being given a fair chance, then I would like to know that so that we can either Carlicia or me or both of us sit and talk with them and talk about how do we how do we overcome that? What would you like to see? That's the way I envision these diversity uh, coordinators to reach out, be actively reaching out, not sit there and wait till somebody calls them. Um, so we're trying to make sure that everybody's welcome here. We're a very open campus, a college, we are. So whatever lifestyle you have and whatever your background is, we, that doesn't, you know, everybody, we want everybody to have an equal opportunity. 
I'm particularly concerned about our um, what students are graduating at. Uh, and we've made a lot of progress. Um, we've had we've had discussions over diversity, and I'm going to talk about it in the next meeting. Uh, in our hiring, I I do think that um, we need to do a better job in our hiring. We have we have been making progress since I've been here. Been the chancellor, fifty percent of our faculty have either been Hispanic or black. We still have a ways to go over that. So it's just a combination of things. It's not the training though. I don't know how we. If I, I perception is that these positions are not training. Right, I get that. But I'm, just, I'm sorry. Who's sorry? If if I could, I, I just want to mention maybe part of my understanding of the outcome, the goal of these positions is that accountability piece, right? We like Dr. Head said, we already have annual mandatory training everyone has to go through. But as it stands now, it's up to each individual after they've done with that training what they do with that training. So my understanding of the goal outcome of these positions would be then to take that next step of accountability and be the, the person at the campuses, at the system office, actually working with everyone on what happens from there. Yeah, I'm sure. I, 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 think, I can get with that and I can, I can see that. And I can also see Trustee Pierce's point to where um, sometimes people won't report because they in fear of retaliation or something, you know, something bad happening or whatever, because it happens. And I just want to make sure that I, I'm all for having somebody or um, not just students, but faculty, you know, can come and maybe speak their piece without being penalized or whatever. But you have to be very careful when you do that. You know, totally you just agree. have to be be careful when you do that. And I understand about Carlisha Wright and all of that. But at the end of the day, that information has to get turned over to the chancellor and to the maybe facility president or vice chancellor, whatever. But you have to you have to keep that in mind because it happens. You can't you can't you, you can't dismiss the fact that that does happen when somebody comes back and makes a complaint about the superior or whatever, and they might not like it. So retaliation is real. You know what I'm saying? Thank so you. you just have to make sure yeah. that that you get that. I mean, you have Thank to get that in mind. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Chair, Madam Chair, Madam Chair Spikes, someone else I, wanted to. Yes, sir. I just want to say that you know, I made my living over the years in business and technology consulting, and every corporation I've worked in, every organization I've worked for, uh, has this structure. They have a senior level person, vice president or, or even higher designated uh, for diversity. They have a structure all the way down to the, the lowest line level of reporting. And they have active programs uh, that, that's put forth almost daily, uh, uh, essentially um, promoting diversity. And they have hotlines, they have omnibusmen. There are a lot of ways that a, a person, if they feel they have been discriminated against by any way, shape or form, that can reach out to someone uh, to uh, you know make that alert. So I guess what I'm saying here, this this is you know a common business practice, and uh, certainly I support it. I mean, diversity is the, is the key to our success here. And uh, uh, but I want you to know it's it's very common, and uh, this this is something that I think is a step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Stoma. Um, any other further questions on this particular? Slide. All right. Do we have anything else? So, yeah, uh, Jennifer is going to spend. We just want to show you what the five year plan looks like. So, we'll spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes over this, then we'll take a break. And so, we'll come back with more information over the five year plan. This is keep in mind that everything's a draft right now, although we're getting closer and closer. To um, we're trying to get our budgets prepared, knowing that we've got some variables in there based on the enrollment issue. So, Jennifer. I, we can't hear Jennifer. Because I'm on mute. <laughs> okay. There okay. you go. <laughs> so. I was trying to ask, like, have I successfully switched which screen I'm sharing? Can everyone now see the five year plan? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. 
Uh, yes. So uh, this, I think everyone has seen the five year plan. I think at least once, if not a couple of times, just the quick lay of the land uh, at, as a reminder, because I know sometimes there's time in between when when we see it, but uh, going across are the years. So first right here is our current year budget. So these numbers are locked. They don't change because the, these, these are the numbers that the board adopted last August for this current budget year. And then I have next to that what our current forecast is for the current year. And then that rolls into year one of the five-year plan. So year one is fiscal year 2022, which would start September 1, 2021. And so this, I mean, granted, as we build the budget, we put it all into this five-year plan so we can see what trajectory the plan, the budget puts us on. But in particular, the details that we have for everyone's consideration here today is what specifically goes into next year's budget that we are building. So that's that. And then up here is the roll up summary of the total. See, here's the total revenues. Uh, so for FY22, for example, we are estimating uh, about 11 million in additional new revenues. That Jump would have a. Can you pull that up just a little bit? Sure. I want to make sure everybody is that, that? better for everybody? Okay. Okay. So that would bring us to almost a $397 million uh, revenues for the budget. Then next are the expenses. And then after that is where we have this is net revenue. So this would be whether we are adding to or using reserves. Uh, and then that reserve down here is presented as a percentage, with 16% being the minimum goal. I believe I have said this before that since COVID hit, we have had a strategy through the spending freezes and the hiring freezes of purposely building up, sort of stockpiling into this cash reserve, knowing that if we have a decline of revenues, <coughs> when it comes to expenses, it seems like it, whether you have a decline in revenues or not, expenses never seem to be able to go down, right? Think costs like property insurance are always going up. So we wanted this purposeful buildup of our cash reserves to give us this cushion to have sort of the gift of time to make sure we get our revenues and expenses in alignment. So right now for the FY22 budget, we are looking at a use of reserves. And like I said, that was expected because this, this current year, we have had a drop in revenues. So that's that high level picture up there. Um, please, as I scroll down, please stop and ask questions at any point. I just that want to make sure you know, uh, let me talk about the reserves just for a minute. So again, uh, standard and course, JP Morgan, <coughs> that we get up to 20 if we could. Uh, 16 is kind of the bottom line. So we've been working our way toward that number however we could, but it wasn't a high, high priority with between the freezes that we've had and uh, we when we did the budget last year, we were expecting a 5% cut in the state and that didn't occur. We uh, didn't have to spend the COVID money the way we thought. We put the budget together last year, we, we were not aware of the stimulus. I mean, we, we did not have stimulus money. So we've been able to backfill some things and restore some of our purchases. But what we're trying to do, though, is um, make sure that we don't continue to fall behind and just kind of operations because we're in really good shape as a college and we, we want to make sure that we continue to move forward the best we can. Knowing that everything we do has multiple year uh, impact. So, Jennifer, if you could just show them, let's just go down to uh, what enrollment growth looks like this. I, I just. I know we've done this before, but I just wanted to show you what we deal with all the time. And Jennifer and I have been working on this budget since September, October of last year, repeatedly taking a look at it. Show them, Jennifer, what uh, enrollment growth and where we are right now with that. Yes. Yeah, so this section shows our revenue. So when you saw up here the estimated 10.9 million in new revenues, 
right here is where that comes from is each of these items, 10 million of it, the bulk of this is from property tax growth. The preliminary estimates that came in, came in at 6.7%, but they are preliminary estimates. So typically I, I do shave about a percentage off just to keep that margin of error in there. So, but of our almost $11 million in new revenues, basically all of it is coming from property taxes. Enrollment, this is enrollment growth that Dr. Head is talking about because this is our second largest revenue source. Right now, the, the thought is to build the FY22 budget assuming we are flat. So that's the 0%. If this were to be a positive 2%, that's 2.8 million. And I'm um, here, I'm just gonna quickly go back so you can see up here, right, how it impacts if we're at 19.2% and then I put this up to 2%, you can see how that increases that percentage. And then you can see the impact in following years. Um, Cause I wanted to point out if 16% is a goal, we do have in year four here, right? It looks like a dip below 16%. So even something as small as a 1% growth will then uh, put us back to where we want to be even within this five year picture. On the flip side, if this were say even a 2% decline, now that moves up the, uh, you know, potentially difficult year up into year three rather than year four. So even small changes in this growth, right? I mean, you can see in the current year, we're still healthy, but you can see that it has, like Dr. Hedge has said, making sure we're looking at the impacts of any of all of this within that next five year window. Um, Jennifer, would you show them so when we're talking about what might happen in July with the enrollment, you can see what the issues are, but I, I will say, so in July, once we see, or say in August, once we see, then we come back and make adjustments for the following year. Jennifer, would you go down and show them what just talk about the uh, compensation, what that looks like? Sure, and, if I could. You know, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll go to compensation. If I could real quick first, I wanted to highlight, we listed on the budget priorities is restoring the repair and replacement budget. So that is here. And then going down to this next section, this is our personnel expenses. Currently for, for the FY22 budget, right? This is where the 2% is. And like I said, the thought is to build the budget with that 2% in there assuming flat enrollment, in which case we that puts us on a, a relatively comfortable path. Uh, but this is where if we don't grow and then and then now the trajectory is not as strong, this is perhaps where if we instead remove this and perhaps did instead stipends, which for the whole system, say might cost about three and a half million, but now it's a one-time expense, not a recurring expense. Let's you stop there. I want to make sure the board- You can, you can I mean, see how that gets us back to where we need to be. Just okay. as an example. Sorry, Dr. Hyde, go. That's all right. I, um, so that's kind of where we are with everything, but I want to make sure the board is seeing and understand i know we've been through this before and i know you understand it but we've got all these different scenarios that we work on a lot but you know we have the basic overhead and and kind of fixed cost and really for board purposes it's approving um, again ultimately the compensation increases and we will come back in with a recommendation again in july based on what we're what we're seeing and and our recommendation will be based on what we see over the next uh, three years, three, four years, maybe. I do think, and I think we all agree that um, helping our employees however we can, but we also need to be aware of just what the impact on the system is. So I, I know we've gone two years without an increase. I, I've got that, and uh, I think we all do. So it, uh, that basically, though, is what we do. We've got the fixed and then the board, 
approves or doesn't want to move forward on some of these projects, then we make adjustments accordingly. So, I know some of you have not been through the process before exactly the way we've done that. This has been a very unusual year. But normally, we'd be having these discussions in February with you. We'd lay it out. Then once you give your blessings to the some of the priorities, then we just put the budget together like that. Then we come back in and um, we would come back in early August. Jennifer, is that the next step over this? So the next step would be a budget workshop. And I think we had brainstormed perhaps towards the end of June, oh. maybe July yeah. would work. The beginning of August, the regular August board meeting is when we need to come in with the fully developed proposed budget for the board to vote on. So between now and the beginning of August, end of June, maybe July is when, uh, if we could have a budget workshop. Well, we'll uh, sorry, that was my, uh, we, Jennifer and I talked about in late July, us having a, uh, another web visit to go through this five-year plan and just make sure that everybody's on board with what we're, what we're seeing. And that I think we'll be a little firmer in our projections than we normally don't have a meeting in July. So again, the plan so, would be to have a Zoom meeting in June, late June. And right, you had initially said late July. I think you meant late June. Yeah, I did. To do that budget yeah. workshop. Yeah, so. Any, we we do not mind if you want a one-on-one -on -one with us or outside of this meeting, we'd be glad to go through this with you. And uh, Jennifer, can you just show them the detail down at the bottom? And how it, you have access to that here. Every time we talk to somebody, we we're not just making up the numbers. This coming from this is connected to our real budget and everything that goes on behind the scenes. It, it it's extremely um, it's complicated and sophisticated. It's just a lot of detail work. I mean, once you see it and you understand where it's coming from, then it it, it makes a lot more sense. I think where the numbers are coming from. I can't say enough about uh, Jennifer and her staff. There's a heck of a lot of work that goes on with this, a lot, a lot. So we're, we're trying to help the students and the employees and be responsible to the board and our taxpayers. And the <clears throat> Chair Saldivar, can I jump in for a second? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Steve and Jennifer, is this the end of the budget presentation? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Uh, I just want to thank you for all the hard work that has gone into this. Clearly, y'all were prepared. You put a lot of effort into it, and it shows. And it's good for our students. It's good for the system. It's good for the campuses, the presidents, the faculty, the staff, everybody. Uh, we're clearly on good, solid financial foundation. And as I often say, I want to thank uh, Vote and Good uh, and Mario for their work prior to us coming on the board and setting up the vision that enables us to be in this good a shape. There are a lot of systems that would like to have the, uh, the financial wherewithal that this system does. Uh, and I think it's one of the things that makes us the best. So once again, congratulations. I appreciate it as a trustee and also thank you for my constituents. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you. So if we don't, have the, the plan would be to take about a 10 minute break and then we'll go into closed session and um, we'll be reaching out again to you for uh, a meeting in late late june to for more information and kind of firm all this up but so link i need your help over if we reconvene at uh 10 45 Chair Saldivar, is that, do we need more time than that? Do we need 15 minutes for everybody to catch up on the work and from there? I mean, I think 10 minutes is fine unless, unless okay. you want, unless I hear otherwise, but 10 minutes should be fine. Okay, so we would reconvene at 1045 and with closed close session, so. If, uh, sir, I don't know if you need to do this or not, but if you want to, uh, you know, read off the closed session piece, and then I can stop the recording, and then I can move you into a practice in, into the closed session at that time, and then you can re restart the closed session. I can make the changes I need to make. Right. Say that again, Lane. So, 
You want me to um, read? Yes, if you can, if you can take the board into the closed session now, then I can actually start the process to to move you technically over. So, in other words, oh, okay. Well, we're we're taking a ten minute break first, and then we're moving to closed session. Okay, so you're gonna take a ten minute break and then come back, and then I'll put you in closed session. I I need about five ten yeah. minutes just to get you moved into closed session. So you want uh, us to? Uh, if, I guess if you can start the process now. If you could start the process yeah, to now be, to get to closed session. Okay, I think so, one of the one of the points, if I could, uh, Madam Chair, that that Link is trying to make is that we need to adjourn to closed session at some point. Whether that happens now, or whether it happens after the break, is is up to you, of course. But the the language that's posted on the screen now needs to be read into the record to adjourn the board into closed session and provide the basis, uh, the the legal basis for the closed session. Okay. So okay. So let me. You're okay if we go now, she reads it, and then we take a 10 minute break and then come back, right? Let yes, that would be fine because it will be reflected in the um, the closed session certified agenda when the closed session was called to order. Okay, all right. Okay, so let me read um, closed session. So the board of trustees in accordance with sections 551.001 of the Texas government code will move into closed session under one or more of the following provisions of the act. And that section 551.071, consultation with attorney. Section 551.072, deliberation regarding real property. Section 551.074, personnel matters. And section 551.076, deliberation regarding security devices. And Link, you're going to be turning the meeting over to me in a few minutes when we come back. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So we're going to take a, we'll take a 10 minute break, and it's how about 10:48? Um, yeah, or 10:50? Yeah, 10:48. Okay. Okay. So we'll be back at 10:48. <laughs> 